Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks for joining me for this uh, webinar on dental sleep medicine. Um, wanted to share with you just some highlight information about dental sleep medicine, what it looks like, why it's so important for dental practices, and then some of the services that DevDent offers to help you be successful in that implementation. A couple things to note, um, down at the bottom of your screen, there's a chat option. Um, you'll see that there's a, um, a member or an attendee named DevDent question and answer. If you have any questions and answers throughout the presentation, you're welcome to post them directly to that user, and those will be answered throughout the process and throughout the presentation. If by chance we don't get to you as we go, um, we'll circle back at the end of the webinar and make sure we answer all of your questions. If any of you are having any trouble with the audio or trouble seeing my screen, you can call into our technical support. It's 855-534-1433, and we've posted that information in the chat as well. And then if by chance um, not all of your team members were available to participate or attend this webinar, these are recorded and available on demand. It takes about 24 hours after the webinar for those to be on our website. So if you see something interesting or you want to share it with another team member, um, those will be available on our website. So we'll go ahead and get started. So my name is Crystal May and I'm the COO of DevDent. I started in medical billing um, for medical doctors about 20 years ago, billed for all specialties from OB to hospital to general practice. And about 15 years ago, I had the opportunity to get into dentistry. And I immediately saw the opportunity to build medical insurance in dental offices. So we began doing that. And we were billing for all types of services like accidents and injuries and um, oral surgery and different procedures that weren't being covered by dental insurance. And then about 10 years ago, I got introduced to sleep medicine. I took my first sleep course and really changed my perspective of dentistry. And it changed how I saw um, the future of dentistry. And it also changed how we ran our practices. So we began implementing sleep into our practices right away. As soon as we got done with our first course, we invested in some technology and, and bought the books and started implementation. And it took us about five years to successfully implement sleep. And this, again, was about 10 years ago. Um, and I mean successfully implement. I mean that it was part of our everyday practice, that it no longer took constant effort or monitoring. And there was no frustration or concern around the team members. And so... Um, once we did that, we decided we were really on to something. We'd found some really good ways to implement, and we saw the changes in our patients and the changes in our practice. And so um, my partner and I decided to develop tools um, and training to help other dentists do this without the same learning curve that we had. And we thought, you know, why reinvent the wheel here? Let us take what we've already learned and know, and we're going to build those tools and share with our, our industry. So and that's what DevDent's all about, is developing tools, education, and support um, to help practices strengthen their, their practice as well as improve the care of their patients. And, and that's what I'll share with you today is some of those things that we developed. First of all, why, why would dentists treat sleep? Uh, why is this a thing? And uh, one of the main reasons is because 50% of the symptoms of sleep disorders show up in the mouth. So the area that we're specializing in and the area we spend all of our time and attention um, indicates that there are sleep disorders. We're talking about tongues and tonsils. We're talking about scalloping. We're talking about arch development and arch shape, even um, bicuspid extractions that have caused things to move back. So I'll go into that in a little bit more detail, but no other profession can legally impress or deliver an oral appliance. That just means that if, if a patient wants an oral appliance for the treatment of their sleep disorder, they have no choice but to find a trained dentist. Um, there are not nearly enough trained dentists in our country to handle the need of these patients. And so we have an opportunity and maybe even an obligation to step up and offer this service to these patients. Also, dentists are seeing the public. It's estimated that 65% of adults saw a dentist last year. That is a far higher number than general population seeing their doctors. Um, when you go to your doctor, your general MD, usually it's for acute illness or injury, and you're focusing on one really specific part of your body, and they don't have the time to look at your sleep and maybe look at your overall health as often as we wish they did. Where in dentistry, we slow down. We get to see in a preventative mode um, two times a year. We get to review their medical histories and talk to them about how they're feeling and just do it at a totally different pace than our MD counterparts. We're, dentists are the ones trained to evaluate above the shoulders. It's our area of expertise. Um, that's the entire upper airway, the, the everything involving the oral cavity and the nose and the TMJ and all those things are our specialty. 
And then, you know, I think maybe one of the most important reasons is, is because we deliver the most cost-effective conservative care. Uh, the alternative um, from a dentist um, providing an oral appliance is surgery or a CPAP. And, and that no one will dispute that it's more cost-effective to do an oral appliance. And it's far more conservative. And, and then our organizations that um, administer or manage the sleep world, so our AADSM, our dental sleep medicine, and our AASM, our sleep medicine organizations, recommend that oral appliances be considered for use in treatment of obstructive sleep apnea. So these organizations are asking for our help. Also, the ADA has made a stance on this. Um, in, in 2017, um, they made a statement, and they said that dentists should be screened for sleep disorders. Um, it's, it's a full policy statement. It, it indicates that we should be looking at medical histories and evaluating and treating when appropriate with an oral appliance. So um, we have an obligation and a role here to fill as a, as a dentist and as a dental um, industry. So just talking a little bit about sleep, um, I truly believe sleep is the foundation of health. Um, and that we know that it's someone who sleeps well and eats well or has appropriate diet and exercises will be healthier. And we know how to do two of these two things better. We can go diet and eat better, and we could choose whether it be a, a, a low carb or a high protein. I mean, we could pick a diet that would make us healthier. Um, exercise, we could obviously, you know, increase our cardio or, or um, yoga, whatever it would be. But when it comes to sleep, we can't go home tonight and say, tonight's the night. Tonight's the night I'm going to sleep better than ever. This is when I've made my commitment to my health. It doesn't, it's out of our control. So, what a significant thing to consider that the thing that probably most affects health is least within the control of the patient. Um, and we love this statement, sleep is that golden chain that ties health and our bodies together. And this is from the 1800s. So this isn't a new concept. It is one of the newer divisions of medicine, but the concept of sleep being a critical piece of health is, is not new. And it's more, just, it's more than just sleep. It's not just do I wake up feeling rested, although that's part of it, but it's quality of life. So we break sleep down into three stages, and we call it light sleep, deep sleep, and REM sleep. And, and during these, these periods of sleep, significant things are happening in the body. Really important processes are happening only during sleep. So uh, deep sleep is when hormones are regulated and our immune system repairs. It's when we get all of our energy back. It's even when our appetite is regulated, and those hormones released at night that tell our body when to burn versus store fat. And if our hormones aren't regulated during that deep sleep, then our appetite is actually affected because those hormones will get flip-flopped and our body will be told to store fat instead of burn fat. So we call deep sleep body sleep. It's, it's what is the, the type of sleep that um, affects overall body health. Uh, then there's REM sleep. Uh, REM sleep we've all heard of at some degree. Um, we call that brain sleep. And this is when our cognitive functions are organized and repaired into our, our memories. This is when Alzheimer's proteins are produced. So if any of you have read articles recently, they've linked Alzheimer's back to sleep apnea because of poor sleep. Um, if you don't get good REM sleep, then your body can't maintain good brain health. Uh, this is also when our mood is regulated. This is where people will start to feel some depression and some mood fluctuation and, um, and think it's just maybe normal when it's because they're not getting good brain sleep. It's obviously, of course, when we dream and when the body is paralyzed. So what affects sleep? So we know how important sleep is, and we know that there's different stages of sleep, but what affects sleep? What interrupts it? We call those arousals. So pain disrupts sleep. Noise disrupts sleep. So if there's a dog outside barking, that's going to affect your sleep. If you've got um, you know, a, a terrible storm, that might wake you up. If you and your spouse or bed partner can't agree on temperature, you may be constantly woken up because it, the temperature is bothering you and, and it, it disrupts your sleep. Um, medications affect sleep and bed partners affect sleep, right? If your spouse or your bed partner is snoring or tossing and turning or has a different schedule than you, then that will obviously affect your sleep. Um, so we can obviously educate our patients on how to influence some of those things. We can teach them um, sleep hygiene and how to properly prepare for bed, but where we most come in is breathing and the poor airway. So you can imagine how hard it would be to sleep if all night long you weren't breathing well and your breathing was being disrupted, your body would wake. Um, I have a video here, but the audio is not going to work, so I'm going to move past it.
and you have to excuse me, I have a little bit of a, a cold, so I'm trying to keep my tickled throat from being in your ear. So this is the cycle of a sleep apnea. We go to sleep. So sorry, we go to sleep and then we go into an apnea state. That means that our body is not getting the proper oxygen. So our body starts to, some sort, something happens. Our airway is um, blocked or disrupted in some way and we go into a hypopnic or apneic state. All of a sudden our body's not breathing, our oxygen is starting to desaturate. I'm not breathing, I'm not breathing, my oxygen is falling. And then the body says, wake up, wake up, or you're going to die. That's called an arousal. And then you reventilate or rebreathe. And then we do that cycle over and over. Each one of those events is called one sleep apnea incident or cycle. In, the, in med sleep medicine, we use a calculator called AHI to calculate the severity of a patient's sleep disorder. So we count how many times an hour a patient has one of those incidents. So how many times did they go to sleep, have their oxygen fall, have it disrupt their sleep cycle, and they were forced to wake to re-energize or to re-breathe. To re so that's called an AHI. That happens five to 14 times an hour. They're considered mildly apneic. If it's 15 to 29, it's considered moderate. And if it's 30 or more, it's considered severe. So this is how many times an hour their oxygen is being affected by their poor sleep. So there's three types of sleep apnea. There's obstructive sleep apnea, which is the most common. Um, that's where we fall into place. This is where oral appliances are considered a primary treatment option. There's central apnea, which is um, with actually a neurological condition where the body forgets to, the brain forgets to tell the body to breathe. And then there's complex sleep apnea, which is a combination. This is what obstructive sleep apnea looks like. And so the, the picture on the left is a non-obstructed airway. The tongue is forward, air is passing be behind the tongue, and the patient is breathing normally. When the patient falls asleep and has an obstruction, the tongue loses its, its um, tension. The muscles relax, we lose our muscle tone, we lose our patency, and the airway collapses. And this happens in a couple ways. One, the tongue falls back, but also the other sides of the airway, that soft muscle is losing its muscle tone and it, it loosens or collapses as well. So no oxygen can flow. And you can see in that diagram that the only way to get air into the lungs is from behind the tongue. So an obstructive patient is just a patient whose tongue, soft tissue, an airway is collapsing at night that's not allowing air to easily flow through and get into the lungs. So that's really where we come into play and what we're gonna focus on are these obstructive apneic patients. This is something that the Cleveland Clinic put together. It was just some surprising facts about sleep apnea that I thought were interesting. So um, they stated many people have sleep apnea but don't know it. So it's estimated that 22 million Americans have sleep apnea and 80% of them are undiagnosed. So that's a huge number. It also can run true in your patient base. So 80% of your patients run the risk of having undiagnosed sleep apnea. Another important thing is that sleep apnea doesn't just affect overweight men that snore. That used to be the idea. There was a stereotype that only overweight old man, men had sleep apnea. That is not true. In our clinics and in our patient base, we see just as many female patients suffering from sleep disorders as men. So we gotta get that stereotype out of our heads. Sleep apnea can also be misdiagnosed um, as depression, fatigue, or even other conditions. So we're finding more and more that sleep apnea is an underlying cause to many of our common diseases and conditions. And so that's something to think about as we think about a misdiagnosis. And then sleep apnea can lead to serious complications. And I'm gonna go into some of those, but it's really important to understand this is just not an inconvenience. This isn't about snoring, disrupting your bed partner, or maybe even sleep apnea, making you a little bit tired. It's so much more than that, and it affects the entire body. So I, I think that's a really important thing for you to take away. It affects the entire body. So, so poor sleep has these statistics associated. So 77% um, correlation to hypertension, 76% correlation to um, congestive heart failure, 90% more likely to have a stroke, and 30% more likely to suffer sudden death. Those are big numbers. And, and if you just took a second and thought of your patient base and thought, thought of the patients you saw earlier today, how many of them would suffer from hypertension? A huge number. It's, we're seeing it every day. 
Another one that we talk about a lot is um, thyroid disorders. Thyroid disorders are often hormones related. We know that hormone, is a, hormone regulation is affected by sleep. So we know that poor sleep can affect thyroid. So as you look at your, your patients that you just saw, and even the patients you're going to see after the rest of the day, if you looked just for those who were hypertensive, had type 2 diabetes, we're complaining of daytime tiredness, you would see the correlation between their likelihood of them having a sleep disorder. So big numbers here, huge deal. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Alzheimer's disease is a big thing. Uh, a lot of studies have been coming out. It's obviously a growing epidemic, epidemic in our country. Um, but on that diagram, you can see a normal brain. You can see a brain that has mild impairment, and then you can see an Alzheimer's brain. And what that is, is that's, that's plaque. And that's what they call the Alzheimer's protein has built up and it's not allowed the tissue to function and, and ultimately the brain tissue no longer works anymore because it's so um, blocked with, with protein or plaque, if you will. So during the REM sleep, the brain tissue actually shrinks in size and increases circulation of fluids, which cleans that protein off or cleans the brain tissue. So the byproduct of, of cells um, or this plaque or this protein, and without the ability to clean it out, over time, it blocks the ability for those tissues to continue to function. So the, the studies just keep coming, Alzheimer's disease and its direct correlation to sleep disorder. So a really important thing to mention um, to your patients who maybe are concerned about that, maybe have family history or maybe taking care of a, an early onset adult who's suffering from that. Um, sleep and pregnancy, I think this is pretty impactful as well. Um, so this one study showed that patients with obstructive sleep apnea were three times more likely to require a C-section and have their babies require NICU treatment. That's a big deal. Um, they also did some placental slides and, and showed that the effect on the fetus is equal to that of the, of the parent or the mother. So the oxygen shortage or those oxygen desaturations that the patient, the mother is experiencing is directly um, affecting that fetus naturally. And so as we think about that, what do we do with that? Well, we look at our pregnant patients and we first identify what risk factors they have and we recommend that they consider being tested. Um, no mom um, would not want to know that this is a risk that she might be facing and that it might be affecting her unborn child. So especially if the patient was overweight before they became pregnant, that they're suffering from um, previous low birth weight babies or previous complications, or if they are hypertensive um, or suffering from gestational diabetes, those are all increased risk factors for pregnant patients. Um, opioid epidemic, we all know this too. It's a problem, right? This is, this is the spread of this disease, and these are overdose, overdose deaths around our country and where they're headed. And obviously, we're overprescribing, and the CDC has stepped in to put in some recommendations. But keep in mind, if a patient is being prescribed a central nervous system depressant medication, which naturally suppresses breathing, and they're already an apneic patient, how we're compounding that disease and how we're compounding that disorder. Not only are we adding to their inability to breathe, but their awareness and their fight or flight is weakened because of the effect of the pain medication. So instead of their body saying, wake up, wake up, wake up, the body is sedated. And so they're not responding the way a normal um, patient that wasn't medicated would during an apneic incident. So, um, any patient who's on high doses of central nervous system depressants should be sleep tested so that we can either find out or rule out if there is an underlying sleep disorder before they put themselves in that situation. The sleep market is huge. Um, this, is a, this is a couple of years ago. This is a, uh, not something they report on too frequently, but $32 billion in annual sales. The column on the, the largest portion of that, or the, the, the um, segment on the right, is mattresses. You guys have all seen mattress sales and mattress stores like crazy. They're on every corner. They have a very aggressive budget and market. Um, but what's sad is right at 12 o'clock, you probably can't even see it. There's this teeny tiny line. That is the appliance uh, market. So that's how much of this $32 billion we have for oral appliances. So people are spending money. They are searching for solutions. They're just not aware yet that appliances are an option. And even our medical um, counterparts aren't terribly aware of our solutions. Speaking of that, so 
we need to understand what system we're going to work in. If you're going to treat sleep, you are completing a medical procedure, and you have to wear a medical hat. You have to think about things a little differently. So we need to know what we're stepping into. So general practices have very little training in sleep. So your general MD, they get no monetary benefit for in-lab testing or CPAP. So we're not competing with them. They're not out there to create income from sleep. Um, it's almost a necessary evil for them. They have to refer patients for testing and they have to refer patients for CPAP, but it's not a big part of their protocols and practices for the most part. They have, um, very few have formal screening protocols and that's even pain clinics. Clinics that are prescribing huge doses of medications that we just talked about affecting their ability to breathe, um, they don't have a protocol. They're prescribing these opioids without screening for sleep disorders. Generally, they're unaware that oral appliances are even an option, and they have no idea about bruxism and TMD and all the other things that dentists can play, that role that we can play. But they've been really, really open to the idea. We meet with doctors, MDs, um, weekly, the specialists and GPs, um, to educate them about um, the dentist's role in sleep and to get feedback. Uh, we have sleep clinics in Utah, and we exclusively treat sleep there. And all of our patients are sent to us from MDs. So we don't market to the general public. We only educate doctors in our community about our role, and they refer to us and feed our clinics. It's been a very successful model. So the general dentist, um, you certainly have that opportunity. We don't suggest you start there. We suggest that you start with your own patient base. You screen your own existing patients that have relationships and loyalties to you. But when you're ready and you've established some traction and you've got your protocols down, it's a pretty easy process to go out and introduce yourself to the general medical population. Um, we even provide packets and letters and information to help you do that to our customers. So um, it's a great way to receive new patients. Um, but most important thing to know is that we're not competing with them. We're helping fill a need, um, a huge need. The, the dentist's uh, role is to really pick up where the medical com community can't keep up, even if they wanted to. So this is what currently happens. You go to your medical doctor, your primary care, and you say, doctor, doctor, I think I have a sleep disorder. And they say, okay, if you have a sleep disorder, then I need to send you to specialist. So they send them to a sleep specialist, and the sleep specialist decides, hey, are, do I agree? Do, you, do I think you have a sleep disorder? And if so, let's get you tested. So the industry standard today is to have a patient spend the night in an in-lab study or complete a PSG or polysomnogram. And you spend the night in the lab and they monitor you for sleep disorders um, in the hospital. So they'll say, okay, I agree, you need to be tested. So you go in and you go to the hospital or the sleep lab and you spend a night in the, study, in the lab and they immediately start monitoring you. And if in the first two hours you have um, established that you are an apneic patient, so you have moderate or higher apnea, then they actually stop testing and they wheel in a CPAP so that they can try to identify what settings to put your CPAP on. So you get tested after, you get diagnosed on two hours of testing and then your, your treatment is decided to be a CPAP and they bring it in. Now, of course, you're not committed to buying that CPAP, but at the very least, you're encouraged to go that route. If in the first two hours they can't diagnose you, then they're going to bring you back for a second in-lab study or PSG where they can titrate that CPAP. So a couple concerns. One is I've now already had to see two doctors at minimum. And if I did have a, the luck of a, of a split night study, meaning that I was able to be diagnosed, keep in mind that patient was diagnosed off of only two hours of testing. That's not a lot of information to diagnose a patient with a disease. Um, so there's good and bad to that model, but this is, this is what's happening out there. Then once you're diagnosed and you've been titrated for a CPAP, and they give you a prescription to take to a DME company. That DME company then um, helps you find the right masks and the right product and which CPAP is going to be best for you. Um, you go back to the specialist and they check to see how it's going and if you're wearing it. And then they evaluate you every 12 months thereafter. So um, they continue to monitor you to see how it's working. Um, now, it's important to know that, that a lot of patients go all the way through this process and are not compliant. Um, they do not continue to go back. They do not continue to restock their supplies. They do not take good care of their CPAP machines. Um, if any of you know people with CPAPs, you'll know that it's a lot of maintenance to maintain them, and it's important that they do. 
Now, I'm not bashing CPAP because CPAP has its place. Uh, the problem just is, is that this process is difficult for patients to maneuver, and then the reality of it is, is CPAP compliance is really quite low. It's estimated that up to 83% of CPAP users are non-compliant. So 83% of the patients who went through that entire process are non-compliant. Compliance is only considered wearing the CPAP for four hours, four nights of the week. So that means 83% of these people can't even tolerate their CPAP machine four hours a night, okay? Um, so this stat I thought was pretty interesting. So this is weeks of use and um, a severe patient, the one on the top, is far more compliant because they have more symptoms, they have more risk, they're, they're more scared that they might die from their sleep disorder, so they're far more likely to commit to the treatment. You can see that moderate patients are kind of in the middle, but a pretty big taper off, and then mild patients are at the very lowest. So the percentage of people that are wearing their CPAP machines with mild sleep apnea is really low. Now, the reason I circled those two is because that's where we fit the best. As a dental community, we can treat mild and moderate patients just as well as a CPAP machine in most circumstances, and the compliant rate is significantly higher. So we can take all these patients who have gone through this process and were non-compliant, and we can treat them, and we can help save people from having to try it and fail as well. So the dental process is a little different. You see the dentist or the hygienist at New Patient and Hygiene, um, and you take a sleep screening. And this can be a number of things, and I'll go into details, but let's just assume we screen the patient, and we decided that they're at risk. So we say, patient, you need to be tested. So you can test the patient in a couple ways, but my favorite method is to actually have a home sleep test option available for your patient, where you send the patient home with that home sleep test, ideally that night, that same day as their hygiene or new patient appointment. They wear it in their own home, and then the results are sent electronically to a specialist for diagnosis. So it's important to note that dentists cannot diagnose sleep apnea. It's outside of the scope of their license. So we have to rely on board certified specialists to do all of our diagnosing. But fortunately, there's an automated way to do that. You do not have to go find a local specialist in your community, especially since so many communities don't even have local specialists. That's not even an option. But you, we have a network of board certified sleep specialists that you can use that will read your results electronically and give you a diagnose without the patient ever having to leave your practice. Then the patient um, comes back to the dentist to go over the results and to go over treatment options for a consult. If treatment options um, make sense for an oral appliance, then we impress, deliver, and titrate for that oral appliance. Then we follow up within you know, anywhere between 30 and 90 days. So once the patient has their appliance, we want to know that it's working. We want to know that we've done our job and we've treated them successfully for their sleep disorder. So we retest them again with the same machine we used before with, with wearing their appliance. And so we confirm success or efficacy of our appliance. If by chance we can't get the results we need, the patient is not responding to um, oral appliance therapy and we've titrated, we've adjusted, and there's nothing more we can do, then we refer them back to a primary care doctor and we usually then end up at a CPAP option for them as well. So that's the reality of what the dental process looks like. Um, we teach it like this. We teach you to screen, test, treat, deliver, and then follow up. Obviously, financial comes in there as well. And you have the option of doing cash versus medical billing, and I'll show you some differences there. So key, screening is the key to success. As I mentioned, there is no more stereotypes of having to be an overweight old man to have this disorder. Any patient in your practice um, should be considered on an even playing field, and they should all be screened accordingly. First thing we do is we look at their medical history. So we're gonna look for conditions like stroke, diabetes, and hypertension. We're gonna look for comorbidities or signs and symptoms. Um, very simple, most of you already have these questions on your medical history. You're already asking about um, if they have hypertension. You may not be asking about acid reflux. You may not be asking about mood or depression or memory loss, but most of these things are in your um, wheelhouse. Then we're gonna look at sleep specific questions. You probably won't have all of these on your medical history. So these are the sleep specific questions we're gonna encourage you to add.
So your daytime tiredness, your snoring, your mornings and feeling great. <coughs> I'm so sorry to have a cough today. Um, so we offer a sleep screening tool. It's called the Imagine Sleep Screening. It takes all of those comorbidities or those medical history questions. It takes their height and weight and their age, and it creates a score. And it tells you their likelihood to have a sleep disorder based solely off their medical history. So how, do they, how is their overall health and how do they report feelings? Then we're gonna look inside their mouth. We're gonna call this the evaluation. We're gonna look for signs and symptoms. Do they have a retronasic mandible? Do they have a large tongue or large tonsils? Do they have a high vault? Has their arch developed correctly? Do they have room for their tongue and their soft tissue? Then we're gonna look at their oral symptoms. So do they complain of tooth pain? Do they complain of TMD? Do they have popping and clicking? These are all signs and symptoms directly related to sleep disorders. We offer a screening tool inside of our software for this as well, where we give you all of the indications of having a sleep disorder. These are your tonsils and your sizes and everything that you might not remember off the top of your head. And you can just click through these charting your patient's intra and extra oral evaluation. We also do look at CBCT. So for those of you who already have a comb beam, if your machine has this capability, an airway analysis is a great feature. The biggest benefit is, is it's another screening tool, but it's also a visual aid for your patients. They can see the red. It's really obvious that I have a narrow airway in this image. And we can tell our patient, this is best case scenario because this patient is awake and standing. So you know that when they lie down and they fall asleep, the airway is only going to get worse. It's definitely not going to get better. So in our company, we believe CBCT will be the standard of care in dentistry, and that because a lot of offices are still trying to figure out how to use them, we think sleep is just another way to use the technology. But we do not require you to have a CBCT in order to treat sleep. But if you have it or are looking at investing in it, just know that this is another way to use it. So once we screen a patient, we have to confirm that they actually have a sleep disorder. Just screening them doesn't tell us if they actually have um, sleep apnea. So the two options to do that, one is that PSG that I talked about. This is an in-lab study, and this is where they spend the night and they're hooked up to these leads, or there's home sleep testing options. And there's lots of home sleep tests on the market, and they all have their pros and cons. I actually have a blog post I'm writing in the next week that is gonna go through the different types of machines, the different types of testing and the benefits and the options between them. But there's all kinds. There's kinds that wear on your head, there's kinds you wear on your chest, there's kinds you wear on your um, wrist. So lots of different options. They do mostly the same thing though. They monitor your sleep, they diagnose a patient with um, apnea, um, different levels of, of testing. Some do um, snoring in sound, some do snoring in decibel, some do bruxism, but one way or the other, the patient has to be tested. Now, if you don't want to invest in a home sleep test in your practice or you practice in a state that doesn't allow it, then you're going to refer to a specialist, and they're going to use one of these same methods. They're either going to have the patient sleep in the lab or they're going to have a patient wear a home sleep test in their own home. So this is really the only way to confirm it. So pulse ox does not confirm sleep apnea. Screening your patients, asking them questions does not confirm sleep apnea. The only way to do it is with a device like this. So the patient wears it in their own home. The results are sent electronically off to a board certified specialist and you receive a diagnosis and a uh, prescription to treat the patient back within 48 hours. So this is the process that we find is most efficient for most dental practices and this is what we do in our clinics. Then you're gonna treat them. So we've screened them, we've tested them, now we're gonna treat them. Lots of appliance options. We spend a good two and a half hours at our courses going over appliance selection, going over titration and bite and position, benefits, which ones are covered by Medicare, which ones are not, which ones are ideal for patients who have um, a TMD, which ones are ideal for patients who have very few teeth, what are our edentulous treatment options. So there's a lot to decide when it comes to oral appliances. Um, but that is something we cover in great detail at our courses as well. And then here's just a few case studies. I like to just show some successes with oral appliance. This is a patient who is middle-aged. Um, he had some risk factors. He'd been seeing a doctor regularly. The doctor never mentioned his, his sleep or asked him about his sleep. 
He saw his dentist. We screened him, decided he was at risk. We tested him and he had an AHI of 8.5. That means 8.5 times an hour, he had a disruption in his breathing that was affecting his oxygen level. So we treated him um, and we got his AHI down to 1.8. So we treated him with an oral appliance. It's really important to realize that this type of patient is your patient. This is your everyday average hygiene patient. He would have gone undiagnosed and untested for years before his condition was realized. And by the time they caught it, he would have likely been in a moderate or severe range. Understand that sleep apnea is progressive. It's not like you wake up one day with severe sleep apnea. You start out with none, you progress to mild, moderate, and then severe. So by catching this patient so early, we were able to get him treated really quickly, get him down to a healthy AHI. Um, realize that unhealthy patients only make up about half of the apnea population. So your other 50% of your apneic patients are going to be your everyday average hygiene patients. These are going to be your 20 to 60 year old patients who um, are struggling with some daytime tiredness. They're struggling with some headaches. Those are the type of patients that are, we can really, really help. Here's his sleep test results. This just shows his AHI and then his improvement. So again, middle of the screen, 8.5 to 1.8. So with an oral appliance, we completely resolved his sleep disorder. Here's another case study. Um, this is a 64 year old female. She was a little bit more unhealthy. Um, suffering from a few more diseases or dis disorders, hypertension, acid reflux. Um, she goes to the doctor regularly um, to manage her hypertension with medication. Nobody has mentioned to her her sleep, her snoring, her acid reflux. She scored very high on our screening scale, and we tested her, and she came back with severe sleep apnea. She had an age, <laughs> an AHI of 54.4. She should have had a CPAP. That would have been the ideal treatment for her, but she refused. She said she wouldn't wear one. She wouldn't tolerate one. Her dad had one and, and she just refused. So we have an obligation as a dentist to still help her get some treatment, even if it's not the most ideal treatment in her case. So we treated her with an oral appliance and we got her results, her AHI down to 16.5. That is considered success in the industry. If she was wearing a CPAP, that would have been considered successful. So we reduced her apnea by at least 50%. And here's her results. So again, AHI from 54 down to 16. A lot of dentists say, what do I do with my severe patients? Well, you're going to recommend that they get CPAP. You're also going to recommend that they consider combination therapy. If they're not going to be compliant with a CPAP, we recommend oral appliance therapy. They need to be treated. And the rule actually states, or the recommendation states, no treatment is not an option. So regardless of their severity, we still have an opportunity to help them. So how are we gonna get paid for this? How does this make sense? So we suggest that you have a discount price for cash, that you would start with a price that patients can afford, um, and then you have an insurance option, and you bill medical insurance for this. Oral appliances are not covered by dental, there are no codes for that. You can't bill dental insurance for oral appliance, but a diagnosed patient can absolutely be billed to medical insurance. It's one of the easier procedures to bill to medical. Here's an EOB, the office charged 3,000, the insurance allowed 3,000, they paid at 95%. Here's one, the office billed 6,500, which is a bit higher than we recommend. Um, the insurance allowed 3,200 and they paid 1,580. So, Understand that just because the insurance is there doesn't mean they're going to pay 100%. Deductibles will still come into play. Coinsurance will still come into play. But as a patient, the fact that the insurance paid $1,580, you reduced my patient portion one way or the other. You also really um, explained yourself to be on the medical side of things, right, because we build medical insurance. And patients will look at you a little differently. This particular example is one that was done by our billing company. Um, you'll see on the right-hand side, each one of those colored lines and all those notes is that it was, um, those were interactions between our billing company and the insurance company. So if you use our billing company, you submit to us. We handle all of the your correspondence and submission and appeals and aging until it's paid. And so you don't have to be on the phone with the insurance company. A lot of people also think that when you bill medical insurance, it's going to take a long time to get paid. And this is showing that this took 30 days um, and we had that EOB paid um, 
for that company. Here's another one, 3,000 paid at 100%. At Here's another one, similar process. These are all the interactions it took to get it paid. Took a little less than 30 days. Office billed 6,500. They allowed 1,950. They paid 1,850. So they paid all but $100 of the allowed amount for that. Um, CBCT, if you're going to be doing them, you can bill medical insurance for them. So in the, around the country, average right now is between um, $250 and $300 um, is what we're billing medical insurance for. Um, this one was a higher one. This one was $600. They paid at $580, but you can certainly bill your CBCTs as well. So we talked about sleep. We talked the importance. We talked about the dentist role. I hope you all understand how important sleep is and how critical that dentists getting involved is in our overall health of our country, but also your patient base. But you can make money at this too. This is a profitable division of dentistry. It's also one of the easiest clinical um, treatments that there are. Now, there's really no easier option, easier um, clinical treatment um, compared to a root canal or an extraction or an implant placement. Um, an oral appliance is about as easy as it gets. So we took um, revenue at $2,500. We were pretty conservative. We took out your lab bill. We took out your billing fees. We took out everything. Again, trying to be really conservative. If you can do two appliances a month, you can profit after expenses about $4,200. If you can do five a month, you're at a little over $10,000. And if you're at 10 a month, then you're a little over $21,000 a month of profit. Most of our customers aim to be in that five range. It's their goal to consistently do about five appliances a month and profit a little over $10,000. So this is a great opportunity to strengthen your practice while you improve the care of your patients. So you can bill for more than just the oral appliance. You can bill for office visits, you can bill for your imaging, but there's also a medical billing opportunity for things outside of sleep. So for those of you who haven't participated in our other medical billing programs, just know that we do offer services to help you bill medical insurance for everything. Your oral surgery, your perio, your um, images and exams, and then anything related to trauma. Those are all procedures that can potentially be billed to medical insurance and something that we talk about a lot. We are doing um, webinar week. Um, so there's a webinar on medical billing. There's two, two a month on medical billing and two a month on sleep. Um, um, two of those are going to be very educational and very specific. So in a couple of weeks, we have a webinar that is going to be talking about implant billing and how to successfully build medical insurance specifically for implants. So definitely some opportunity there. And when someone asks me, well, can I bill for that? Can I bill for an implant? Can I bill for an endo? Uh, my, my answer is yes. You can bill for anything. But it's not about the procedure. It's about why you're doing it. So you have to be really aware that if you're doing an endo uh, on a tooth that needed endo because of caries, they don't consider caries a medical condition. So they're not gonna consider the endo a medical condition. But if you have a patient who's been in an accident, you have a patient with periodontal disease who's also diabetic, there's some pretty specific examples that we see that are very successful. We just have to prove medical necessity. So it's not about the procedure code, it's about the diagnosis code, it's about why you're doing it. And we do break that down into six categories of medical billing. So if any of these are procedures that you're doing on a routine basis, uh, might be worth exploring those opportunities. Um, there's really seeing some practice building opportunity with adding medical billing. So why bill medical insurance? Why would you take that on, whether it be for sleep or for anything else? Because if we can um, increase your case acceptance by decreasing your patient portion, it's worth the effort. So if your big cases are walking out the door, patients can't afford your um, implant supported dentures or patients can't afford these asleep appliances because they can't write you checks for $3,000. If we can get medical insurance to kick in um, and decrease their portion, it will increase their case acceptance. Also, if you're billing for a procedure that could potentially um, be billed, if you have a procedure that could potentially build to medical, then by doing that, you leave those dental benefits alone. And we all know that dental benefits don't go very far. And so we want the opportunity to build uh, what we can to medical and then leave those dental benefits for your class two fillings and your profies. Get paid for what you're doing. I can't tell you how many offices I talk to who write off procedures. They're writing off images, they're writing off PAs, they're writing off CBCTs. Um, and it's because dental insurance isn't paying for them. There's a frequency limitation or some sort of restriction. And I'm, and I'm here to say, that's not how medicine works. 
you don't go to a medical doctor and they adjust your x-ray because it wasn't covered by your insurance. They don't take three x-rays and only charge you for one. That's what we do every day in dentistry. So we're trying to encourage you to kind of take a different look at things. And if you can wear that medical hat a little bit here, you can see that opportunity. And then medical doesn't have those maximums and frequency limitations. So we don't have to worry about if we did that, that bite wing or that pano, you know, in the right distance of, of time. We can take them as often as we need to based on medical necessity. And then separate your practice from others. By implementing sleep into the practice alone, you will have an opportunity to have medical doctors and specialists refer to you. But when you add medical insurance, it just takes it up to that other notch. Medical doctors want to refer to other professionals who are billing medical insurance. It's what they're used to. It's what they know. So if you have that opportunity um, to separate yourself from your competitors or other dentists in your, off in your area, not by offering promotions or free whitening, but by offering more comprehensive care and by billing medical insurance, I uh, really feel like that's going to insulate you from, from, you know, potentially what's happening in our industry. So really, there, there's really no reason why you wouldn't bill medical insurance for particular procedures. So where to start? We suggest you take a course. You need to learn the basics. You've got to learn the clinical. You've got to learn how to talk to patients. You've got to learn how to get them screened and tested. Then your team has to be on the same page. Dentists cannot do this alone. This is a team, team effort. This is going to take hygiene, front office, back office, and doctor all on the same page. Then you're going to have to decide how are you going to screen and track and bill, and then you're ready to implement. And we suggest you start with protocols and screening. And, and we break that down um, into some details at our courses. So our solutions, um, DevZen as a company offers education, training, and implementation. That is your on-site team training. Those are your two-day courses. That's your remote coaching and consulting. We offer Imagine Sleep software, which is a cloud-based sleep software handling all aspects of dental sleep medicine. That software is cloud-based, but it's also Dentrix connected. So if you happen to use Dentrix, you would take advantage of that opportunity. But if you're not a Dentrix customer, you can still use our sleep software. This is going to handle those screenings I showed you and those evaluations. It's also going to handle all of your referral letters, your communication with your patient, your communication with your local doctors. It's going to handle all of your medical billing and your reporting. Everything you need, including your soap note generation, happens in that sleep software. And imagine billing software and service. This is also a cloud-based software. Um, this can be used with the sleep software or standalone, and this is where we actually handle all of your billing. So we have a sleep software, or excuse me, a billing software that does all your cross-coding. So you enter your CDT code, your dental procedure code, and our software automatically cross-codes it over for you to the medical side. So you don't have to memorize all the medical codes and some of those things that are a little more challenging when you first get started in medical billing. This is the process we start or we teach. Um, we break it down um, in 30-day increments, and we teach the first week you're going to screen, the second you're going to start testing, the third you're going to nail your presentation, your fourth you're going to have your appliance nailed down, your lab chosen, you're going to be comfortable. You're going to do a minimum of 10 appliance in the first 30 days. Those are typically on team members and spouses and friends and family. We help you with this process, making sure that after a course, you can go back and actually start implementation. Um, so we offer a dental sleep medicine simplified course. Those are offered throughout the country. Those are a partnership with Henry Schein. So they'll be held at Henry Schein facilities um, throughout the country. You can go to devdent.com to see our course calendar. It's a two-day course. Really important to note that um, it's a step-by-step -step implementation. So it's not just clinical. It's not just uh, medical billing. It's the whole process. We pick four attendees and we actually screen them, test them, and treat them as part of the course. So you'll get your hands-on experience with four potential patients. And then every doctor who attends also gets to take a complimentary home sleep test on night one. So the first night, we'll hand out sleep test machines. You guys will wear them at your home or your hotel. And then you bring them back the next day, and we go over those results. And so you're getting tested in the process as well. Um, if um, the course is in pre-registration, it's discounted to $4.99 per attendee, two days, 13 CEs. And then we offer an identical course for medical billing. So um, this is Start Medical Billing and Boost Case Acceptance, same pricing, Henry Schein facilities. Um, instead of a home sleep test, you get a 150-page workbook that shows you all the coding and soap note templates and everything you need to get started. 
So if you're not a member of our Facebook group, we do have a public group. It's called Medical Billing for Dental Practices hyphen Imagine Billing. You can go on Facebook and find us, answer a few questions. It's a very interactive group. Um, we're answering questions about sleep and billing on that group, and you can post your questions there. So we're going to stay on for a few minutes and go through and answer some questions. If you have any, please submit them in the chat book or chat box, excuse me. And then a reminder, these will be available on demand if you'd like to rewatch or share with your team member. And then stay tuned because the webinars will continue to change topics and we'll have an educational sleep um, webinar coming soon and that educational billing webinar on how to bill for implants. Thanks for your time.